Thank you for coming this afternoon to our presentation from Last Watch Labor and Sex Trafficking Watch Group. Our speaker today is Brenda Long. Brenda is a dedicated wife and caregiver. She's the mother of three, stepmother of three, second mom of an adult foster daughter, grandmother of 28, and great grandmother of four. Brenda is a native rural Iowa girl who has also lived in Texas. Kansas, and California before returning home to her roots. She was raised on a farm in central Iowa, shared a house with her parents and seven other siblings. She now enjoys living in the wide open spaces of rural Iowa with her husband, Steve, and their family pets and horses. In her spare time, Brenda enjoys reading and learning new things. She's an active member of Heartland Church. Brenda's history includes working with CASA, or CASA for at-risk children, volunteer services with Safe Home for Young Women at Risk, and 13 years of foster parenting along with her husband. She's a graduate of JSMI School of World Evangelism in Fort Worth, Texas, and her ministry credentials with Heartland Alliance in Anchor. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Randa Long. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Lynn, thank you for inviting me. And I'm assuming there's other people that was involved in that decision. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share about uh, Garden Gate Ranch and also to help educate the community about human trafficking. Um, today, we are going to talk about sex trafficking in particular. Uh, I have a few survivor stories to share. And then we'll share about what Garden Gate Ranch is doing in our state to help uh, survivors, and then we'll, if we have time, we'll do a Q&A, if that's okay. All right. Um, how many here have no, have been in other um, meetings where you've been told about human trafficking? How many is aware of trafficking? Pretty much everybody. That's good. That's good. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about a very dark subject today, and um, I don't see any young moms, so that's good. <laughs> Uh, but I will say, um, many times this will maybe bring up some things from your childhood or your past. And don't be afraid to get up and step out in the hallway if you feel like you need to, just to kind of protect yourself and, and to, you know, just settle yourself down if, if you are triggered with something. Um, in 2015, I became uh, very aware of human trafficking. And I joined the ranks of many other people in our state that are working um, at helping to make awareness in our community as well as helping the vulnerable um, that are being preyed upon. The light has been turned on to the dark reality that sex trafficking is actually happening right here in your city and in our state and in our nation. And we at Garden Gate Ranch have come to realize that many sexually violated victims are actually still falling through the cracks in our community. And they're stepping right back in, or stepping into the hands of predators. And sometimes, many times, right in front of our eyes and we don't even recognize it. So I believe we have a solution to the harsh reality and a way to help close that gap. And one of the things is education is very big. So I'd like to start out by reading you Heather's story. Some of you may have heard um, Heather's story before. She was um, trafficked here in Iowa and she was actually one of our speakers at our annual gala uh, and giving her testimony in 2019. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna read her story and not try to tell you ver verbatim. So uh, this was uh, written in 2019 and she says, about seven years ago, when I left the local hotel, I remember the noise of the children playing in the pool right outside the room, the sounds of the airplane overhead, the smell of the still liquor on the man's breath, the marble floor, floors in the entry, and the eager to help front desk clerk. I remember lying on the bed atop a white blanket as the man reached me. What I remember the most from that night is the conversation that the guy had with me. The, the guy wanted to was asking me about what do you think we should get 
our daughter for graduation. You see, 11 years ago, as a freshman in college, I met a man I thought would one day be my husband. After six months of dating and grooming, I realized I was in something that later would be identified as sex trafficking. For eight long years, I was bought and sold all over the state of Iowa and surrounding states. People often ask me to sum up my experience, and there is no easy way to do it. Eight years of rape, burns, cuts, bruises, can't be summed up. My typical answer to anyone who asks is, it's like having breakfast with the Lord and dinner with the devil. I would wake up in my dorm, spend the day with my friends in class or at work, and then I was sold all night. In 2012, I was working at a local grocery store in Omaha. I woke up one morning and decided I was done, and I didn't care if it took my life. I wanted out of the world I had been forced to partake in. A week later, I walked out of the store from the, for the last time, drove straight home, which was here in Iowa. I didn't stop at my apartment to get my stuff. I didn't say goodbye to my friends. I just drove. Once home, I had a few months of freedom until my trafficker showed up. Once again, I found myself being sold at night and on weekends. I remember thinking, this is it. This is what my life is going to be. In 2014, I finally confided in a close friend. I was being trafficked, and she didn't believe me, so I changed my story. February 2017, I was introduced to someone who would turn out to be the beginning of my freedom. I saw, I say I was, I say, excuse me, I say it was the work of God. Some say it was faith, but for me, <laughs> for the first time, I sat down with someone who talked and talked and wasn't judged for my past. I wasn't forced to answer questions I didn't want to. I was listened to, validated, and was made to feel this may really be the real end. This new found friendship wasn't easy. There were challenges, safety risks, risk, threats from the abuser and his family to me and to her and many sleepless nights. At one point, we looked for a safe place for me to go, but there were no openings. I was finding it even more difficult for my doctors to understand the trauma I had lived through. Sex trafficking until recently wasn't something that was talked about, but knowledge is power, and in a world of manipulation, the more people we make aware of sex trafficking exists, the more powerful we will become in the fight against it. We all have an opportunity to support the recovery of survivors waiting to have their voices heard, waiting for a safe place to lay down at night or even a place they can talk without judgment. It only takes one person to believe in me and provide me with the right resources. <laughs> Are you that one person for someone else? I'd like to ask a question as well to everyone here today. Can you be a light in this dark world for someone around you? Will you commit to educate yourself about human trafficking? And all of you are doing that right now, but don't let this be the one and only if it is. Then get involved some way to help shed more attention on this horrific crime and help bring a stop to it. So many people like, what can I do? There's a lot everyone can do. So what is human trafficking? Human trafficking is modern day slavery and involves the use of force, fraud, and coercion to obtain some kind of labor or commercial sex act. There's different time, types of human trafficking. There's labor trafficking, debt bondage, forced marriage, domestic servitude, organ trafficking, forced child labor, child soldier, which we really don't have here in the US, I hope, <laughs> and sex trafficking. <clears throat> and today our subject is going to be a sex trafficking, which is forced prostitution. I don't know about any of you, but when I first heard about trafficking, I had always had this mindset of it's prostitution and they make the choice to be there. And I, I used to be ashamed of that, but I find out everybody thought that. So it's just, I think, human nature. Um, 
But trust me, nobody, when they were three or four years old, told their mother, when they grew up, they want to be a prostitute. They want to be sold for sex. So nobody chooses it. Even many of them say they do. There's something that brought them there. So the act of forcing or manipulating another person to have sex or engage in sexual behaviors for the monetary gain of someone else in exchange for something of value could be money, could be drugs, could be housing, could be food, could be medication, could be anything. So before we talk about Iowa, let's just look at a few uh, stats globally. According to Polaris, human trafficking enslaves 28 million people around the world. I don't think we can even wrap our head around that. That's 28 million children, young women, and young men being raped every single day for someone else's profit, for someone's greed. It's an estimated $40 billion a year criminal industry. That's McDonald's, Google, and Walmart yearly combined. It's more than that. So when I when I first heard about trafficking, first I wanted to deny it was true. And then, you know, you always want to think it's somebody else's problem. Let's just be honest, right? If something bad's happening, it's not happening in our neighborhood, it's not happening in our town, it's not happening in our state. So you always want to think it's somebody else's problem. So you you finally come to the conclusion, okay, it's happening, but it has to be in Thailand and Cambodia and Mexico, right? It's not here in the U.S. But it is. There's 3.5 million buyers right here in the United States at any given time, raping young women daily. And who are these buyers? <laughs> They're businessmen and women, government officials, pastors, youth pastors, laborers, <laughs> farmers, women, the also famous bachelor party, attorneys, doctors, teachers, professors, and many times it's even their own family. Hundreds of thousands of individuals are trafficked every year in the United States. There's an estimate of 600 to 800,000 human trafficking victims in the United States. We have the largest number of slaves in the United States that we've ever had in history. In 1865, slaves were freed. The underground freed them. And today the underground is enslaving them. And the underground is the internet. That's where a lot of things are happening behind apps, on websites, uh, the dark web that most of us don't even, I wouldn't even have a clue how to look on the dark web but that's where they're hiding. And so that's the new underground. They say there's approximately 300,000 children in the United States being trafficked, but um, actually Texas itself is claiming there's 300,000 just in Texas. So it really just gives you an idea. Numbers are hard for any um, anybody to track because the truth is, only 1% are actually being identified. So the numbers that they have are numbers that they can count, but not necessarily the true number. So I took a look at this 300,000 of children, you know, we don't want anybody trafficked. And of course, we, you know, children just touches everybody's heart. But I uh, looked at the number of children in Iowa. And for 300,000 children, that would be every child in Iowa eight and under being sold. That's unfathomable to even, so that, that would be in the United States. Like I said, 1% who are being identified very few are finding care afterwards. 80% of survivors end up being re-victimized if they don't find a safe place to go. 
this criminal enterprise is now surpassing the international drug trade. And why is that? Low risk, high profits, right? You can, a dealer can get drugs, sell drugs. He has to go back tomorrow and get more drugs. He can go to the mall, pick up six young women today and sell her repeatedly every single day until she somehow escapes. He doesn't have to replenish her unless she waits, which they make that very hard. So well, who are the people? The truth is there is no exemptions, just like the list I read a little bit ago. There's no exemptions of slave owners, traffickers, rapists, right? Businesses, you know, excuse me, business owners, government official, law enforcement, judges, doctors, parents, family members, gang, women, neighbors, college cheerleader. There's a story or a young woman in Oklahoma. I think it was Oklahoma State College, got arrested because she was trafficking her cheerleading squad. Started trafficking them to all the football players and then it went beyond that. And she's in prison. She went to prison for it. And there's no exemption of victims. There's no gender, it's not one or another, right? There's no age difference. Um, the social, global, and economic uh, demographics, it truly could be any one of us sitting in this room, or it could be any one of our children or grandchildren. I have had seen stories and seen um, cases of children as young as three months and as women as old as eight being trafficked. The average age that um, when they enter this horrific injustice is 12 to 14. That's the age that traffickers like to focus on. So how does this happen? Someone is targeting someone else's vulnerabilities. So you have to ask yourself, what's a vulnerability? And again, and I'm gonna keep saying it, it's like, we always wanna think it's somebody else's problem. We always wanna think it's the foster kids, it's the runaways, and yes, they're in that group, but it goes way beyond that. So who's vulnerable? Those that are desiring and looking for love and acceptance, those with low self-esteem and self-worth, those who are desensitized to violence and unhealthy relationships, if they grow up in that environment, they think it's normal. Those experiencing poverty and hopelessness, homelessness, those in debt, those struggling with addictions, those coming from broken, dysfunctional and abusive homes, those with prior sexual trauma, those without a good understanding of the law, runaways, those with little or no education, those in the child welfare system or the foster care system, those, tra those traffickers have access to anyone. And actually everybody has vulnerabilities. What would you do for your family? What would you do for your health? It's a life or death situation. I mean, Heather's story, she had cancer and she had to go to Iowa City for treatments and they would not let her go unless she made four stops on the way there and four stops on the way back. And when she refused to do it, she never got the treatment she needed. Um, interesting enough, one of my very first contacts of a phone call from a survivor came right out of Marshall County. It was kind of ironic. Um, we weren't open yet. Um, I was actually driving to Kansas City to go to a conference, and I got a phone call from a young woman, and she said, I'm calling to see if you have any beds. And so I had to tell her we didn't, you know, we weren't open yet, so we didn't have any beds, but I would help her find a place. And so she proceeds to tell me that, um, I hope I don't get too many details because she's local, but um, she proceeded to tell me that she uh, had a medical issue that caused her to have to leave her job. 
And then after she left her job, when her money got short, she lost her apartment and she ended up having to move in with a family member that she did not want to move in with, but she felt like she had no choices. And when the little bit of money that she had ran out, they started putting her on the internet and selling her. And uh, she told me that she, if she didn't get out, that she had to get out. And so we, I, I made phone calls and we got a place for her. And uh, she, she told me that she goes, I will call you when I'm ready because I let her know that we had a place. And she's like, okay, I'm trying to get little things out so I can leave without them knowing. And when she called um, within an hour, we had somebody here picking her up and taking her to a safe house. Within three days of being at the safe house, she disclosed that she had quit taking her medication for her medical issue, which actually could have killed her. And she was saving it up because she had set a date that if she didn't get free from this situation on a particular date, she was going to commit suicide with that medication. And we didn't know this at the time, but the date she set was the very day somebody pulled up and picked her up and got her out of there. And she is doing amazing. So you might ask yourself, where is this happening? How is this happening? Where is this happening? It's actually in the home in many places. And I'm sure law enforcement can detest to that, that a lot of times it's family members that are doing this. It's strip clubs, massage parlors, and hotels, and schools, and the mall, churches, truck stops, campgrounds, warehouses, family gatherings. It's possibly your next door neighbor. I'll tell you a real short story about that. I was um, actually with Governor Reynolds and some of her uh, security people. And one of the detectives was telling us about, they had heard this story about this young woman and the only thing they knew was her street name. And so they were looking for her, trying to find her and months had gone by and he still didn't know who she was. Nobody could would disclose what her, what her real name was. All they would disclose was what her street name was. And so months had gone by and one day uh, his neighbor came over and was talking to him about some suspicious things that she was seeing with her daughter. And come to find out that was the young woman who was looking. And he's an investigator, and she was right next door, and he didn't see it. So that's how, I mean, it is so hidden right in plain sight. Um, it is absolutely crazy. Happens at corporate after parties. You know, I've had, I mean, again, I hear so many things. It's, I don't know how I can sleep at night sometimes, <laughs> but... You know, they have their corporate parties and then there's a party after the party, right? And people that you would think wouldn't do stuff like this, corporate America, right? Happens at sporting events, any large events, and of course on the internet. Exactly. I'm gonna um, read you Jessica's story. Um, again, just so you know, I've had permission to read these stories, and these were young women that actually shared at our public gala. But Jessica's story is, I was, it was my third birthday. Some of my parents' friends from our church had gathered for a little birthday party. I trusted, a trusted woman offered to change me into my pajamas as a kindness to my mom. Soon, her husband came in and molested me while she stood there and watched. This is my very first memory. Soon after my parents' divorce due to my father going to prison for sexual abusing multiple teenage girls. <clears throat> Once my brother was born, my mom moved us away for a fresh start. Looking back, I can see what targets we were, a single mom with two young kids. Leaders of a church we began going to befriended my mom. They did kind things for us and supplied needs because we had nothing. That woman, however, became my madam, all the while continuing to be a leader in our church. For those who don't know what a madam is, it's a female trafficker. This was the church in Des Moines. 
As my grade school year started, countless people would push past molestation and rape me. My tiny body desperately tried to hold doors closed so people couldn't get in. I was dragged by my ponytail down the hallway into a back bedroom of a stranger's house. I was molested and raped by extended family members on vacation. I was beat into submission. I fought back once. I have flashbacks when I, where I can physically feel myself being raped. The body doesn't forget. I have flashbacks of my handlers talking about me in front of me. She is so pathetic, so stupid. She will never know how to please and keep a man when she's grown. No one is going to ever want her. She's worthless. I still have flashbacks where my head jerks back and my mouth tries to open as wide as it can because my madam was yanking my ponytail back so hard as I'm forced to perform oral sex. In third grade, I chopped my hair off, but no longer could my hair be pulled into a ponytail. I was punished for cutting my hair. At the time, I didn't realize why I had even cut it. You see, by the grace and the protection of the Lord, I spent 30 years of my life not knowing what had happened as my memories were suppressed. I only knew that I was terrified to leave my mom's side, scared to go on family vacations with certain family members and scared to go to church. I didn't know why I was afraid of my own shadow, afraid of being alone, stricken with severe anxiety and panic disorder. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I thought I was going crazy. Starting in eighth grade, I dove headfirst into scripture and prayer that kept me close to the Lord. I begged and cried God to heal, to heal me, to show me what was wrong with me. Around age 31, in the Lord's gracious, loving, and merciful way, he answered the lifelong prayer of mine and many around me, that we would find the root of my severe anxiety. And the answer would be that it wasn't anxiety all along. It was severe, complex PTSD caused, caused by being sexually abused, trafficking from age three to well into my teen years. My entire life was absolutely broken and shattered, but it made sense. It finally made sense. The Lord continues to draw me into his presence for comfort. He continues to gently reveal new ways that are next in my healing journey. I thank God for what he has done to bring healing into my life, and I thank him for opening Garden Gate Ranch to help others like me who have experienced the trauma of exploitation. Garden Gate Ranch is a safe place for survivors to find true healing and freedom. I've partnered with them since nearly the opening day and cannot express how great of an impact their program has on survivors by providing an opportunity for, free, for true freedom and healing found in only Jesus. One in three girls and one in five boys will be sexually assaulted before the age of 18. So why do we have this? Who fuels it? It's the buyers. If we didn't have a demand, we wouldn't have a product. And they are actually treated like products. So it's the buyers, the Johns, the rapists, whatever you want to call them. And again, I think there's times we want to think it's, you know, maybe the inner city, maybe it's, you know, we want to kind of, again, put it in somebody else's bucket, not in your own neighborhood. But in all honesty, here in the United States and in every part of the world, it's white men mostly with money. And I love white people <laughs> and white men, so um, I'm not one of those. <laughs> but that's who it is. It's people that have jobs, people that have money, and mostly it's men, not all. There are some women like you've already heard. So the lifespan in this lifestyle, that's probably a bad term, is seven years. If they don't get out within seven years, it's usually an overdose, it's usually um, taken their own life, someone's killed them, they've disappeared, nobody knows where they're at. And here's another one that just really shocked me. Again, you know, you want to put it out there. 
So if it's happening in the United States, it's because they're bringing women in from Mexico and Cambodia and all of that. It was shocking for me to find out that 85% are actually US citizens, not from foreign countries. So currently less than 2% find freedom, freedom from abuse, violent rape, other physical violence, unimaginable trauma, as you can imagine. Uh, freedom to say no, to live in peace, freedom to be loved, and freedom to choose. So is it really happening here in Iowa, right? If I have to go any further, but I will. <laughs> and I'm just going to read some headings of newspaper articles that have been printed, um, bringing light to this. And again, just the headings. Seven Des Moines residents charged with sex trafficking, that's say. Good morning, register. We'll be the article. I'll be here for four hours. Seven people from Des Moines sentenced to prison for sex trafficking ring. Urbandale police say social media, use social media to capture a man accused of enticing young girls over Facebook. Next article just talks about crimes that sexually exploit children rise on the internet. And it talks about the internet boom. A uh, man charged with sex trafficking at Flying J in Altoona. Officials warn the problem is getting worse. Iowa, Iowa man charged in Chicago sex trafficking case, and it was a Iowa girl, two teenagers. Iowa couple, everybody's very familiar with this one, I think. Iowa couple sentenced to 40 years for kidnapping, sex trafficking, and torturing a young woman. And those are just a few of articles that have come out. Um, I actually did, I grabbed these stats when I first started speaking on the subject, and I need to update it, but in July of 2017, there was 1,350 1, commercial sex ads um, that month. And on the internet or in paper print so people could see it. Uh, they say that number goes up 400% whenever there's a large gathering, like the, the state fair, um, all of the you know sports activities and stuff. What that surprised me the most, and I don't know why it does, the Pork Dog Expo, mm -hmm. like is one of the highest. And they're not doing it at the Pork Expo. They're not doing it at the state fair, more than likely, unless it's in camp or something. But other, I mean, it's, this is a whole, this is a, I mean, these people are smart. I'm, if, if they put their wisdom into building a true business, <laughs> it would be good. Uh, but there was the traffickers in different parts of the country, you know, Chicago, Kansas City, Minneapolis, whatever, they bring young women to the state of Iowa during the state fair and they have them set up in places and wherever there's a big group of people, trafficking is happening. And out of that 1,350 ads in that particular month, 945 of those ads were high risk that they were actually children from the way they were depicted. So, so how to respond if you, I can give you these numbers later, I should have brought a slide or something to put them up. Um, uh, you know, of course, calling 911. Don't ever try to rescue a young woman. Chances are you could get hurt yourself or more than likely they will get hurt later. Um, so let law enforcement take care of it. Um, help in educating, help in, you know, other organizations that are doing things, but don't go out and do rescue. That's not good. Um, there's a national human trafficking hotline number, which you probably have the 888-3737-888 number, easy to remember. Um, call the Iowa Victim Services. Again, I have that number or text Iowa Help to 20121. And for freedom from sexual addictions and destructive sexual behavior, there's also an organization that helps with that. And that's for people that have sex addictions and really need help to get out of that. 
And then there's lots of training on the safe house project on Oregon website, if you're ever interested in looking at any of those. So a little bit about how I got involved. Um, in 2015, I had a very supernatural awakening, awakening to this horrific crime. And my heart, in my heart, I heard women crying out for help. I heard phrases like, no one cares, no one is looking for me. They look right at me, but they don't see me. They don't think I'm worth fighting for. I felt their pain that day, and my heart was broken for these young women whose basic rights have been denied them, whose dignity has been stolen, whose voice has been silenced, whose souls have almost ceased to exist whose spirits have been crushed. I started weeping for women that day that I have never met and I haven't stopped yet. But I knew I had to do something. I realized that this was my mission and these women were my mission field. Evil is so real, but I want you to know courage is real too. Because it takes courage to want to live beyond sexual trauma. Most of the time, they don't have a will to live, they want to die. They may not be suicidal, but that's, they just don't have a will to really live. It takes courage to accept help from complete strangers. It amazes me every single resident that comes to Garden Gate Ranch says, she came. I'll be honest, it's like, they do not know us. They don't trust anybody. They sometimes come from a different state. A total stranger picks them up whether it's at the airport or on a bus, and brings them to the country, <laughs> right? Yeah. With a fence and a gate, <laughs> and we're here to help. I mean, that takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to trust again, because most of the time, the ones that they trusted is who actually did this to them. And it may have been a stranger at one point, but then, he becomes a boyfriend and then he grooms and then he goes in for the slaughter. It takes courage to fight and do the hard work to get your life back. Again, every day is a struggle. Every day for a long time, they're one foot in, one foot out. I'm leaving. No, I'm going to stay. I'm leaving. <laughs> it's back and forth and I get it. <laughs> and it takes courage to tell your story. So I've had said yes to working with as many of these young women that I can and that will love me. They need to know that they're not forgotten. Women and children are being sexually exploited in our community and state, most without a safe, secure place to call home. Not having safe shelter keeps them in very vulnerable situations with a high probability of being preyed upon and trafficked again. So oh, who is Garden Gate Ranch and what are we doing? So Garden Gate Ranch is a faith-based Christian organization providing restorative and transitional services for sexually exploited women and their young children. And we seek to rally our communities to ensure that all women are free from exploitation and abuse. And so this is part of that. Thank you. We have a dream at Garden Gate Ranch that someday all women will be free from exploitation, rape, and abuse. In 2015, we had a dream of a community coming together to support her every step of the way, not to fear her and not to ignore her. It's amazing how many volunteers we have come in and then at one point they'll say, I didn't know if I could help women like this, but they're just like us. And it's like, yeah, they are. So we have, um, since 2015, that's when I was first awakened into this. Um, in 2017, we became a nonprofit 2018, we started fundraising. 2019, we purchased a $1.25 million property for $250,000. <laughs> the Lord is good. I was I was actually a real estate agent for 17 years, and I kept my license two years beyond really working in real estate because I thought he needed help. He didn't. <laughs> I had nothing to do with my real estate business. <laughs> In 2020, um, so in 2019, we purchased that and we renovated it. Um, my husband said there's over 110 gallons of paint inside that house. <laughs> and he says, I'm probably not giving the right number. He thinks it's more, but anyway. 
Um, in 2020, we opened and started serving women and their young children. And we actually opened April 1st, 2020. So when everybody was closing their doors, we were opening. Mm -hmm. uh, we're located in the greater Des Moines area in the rural setting. Uh, we have a 7,000 square foot home, 4,000 square foot. It was a beautiful man's garage. And I say all the time, every man that worked on this to transform it into our education center and offices cried. <laughs> it had a boxy floor, it had M3, it had a car lift, it had a floor drain. It, I mean, it was every man's dream. And he had a full of antique Corvettes. <laughs> so it was every man's dream, right? Um, it sits on approximately 15 acres. Uh, we have also built uh, cottages. We have one complete and the second one, and it's occupied. And the second one is in the process of completing, and that's for our transitional housing um, after they graduate from the ranch. So at Garden Gate Ranch, we have two unique uh, programs. And our first program is our continuing restoration program, and it's for women 18 and over with young children. Now, if a, uh, a woman calls that's in that age bracket, but she has no young child with her or isn't pregnant, um, we actually refer her on to another program because we keep our, our beds for young moms. And my whole experience with um, foster care is where that came from. I just really felt very strongly that these young girls needed help with their children and not lose them. Uh, so the ranch is open, like I said, and, and operating, and uh, we've had numerous women come in. Uh, we actually can have four in the house, with, and each woman could have two children. Uh, to date, we've only had one woman that actually had two children. Everybody else has been a single child, so in some ways, we're kind of grateful for that. <laughs> it's a very busy house. Um, and they can stay up to 24 months and it's free of charge. So our community supports these young women to come and just be there for 24 months. And then we have our independent transitional cottages. And this is, um, each woman has her individual apartment. It's, we actually had to build duplexes. I wanted these cute little cottages, but the county had us do duplexes. And we're like, okay, but I still call cottages. But anyway, they're really cute. So two bedroom, one bath, uh, single car garage, kitchen, living room open. Um, it's like 800 square feet space, uh, brand new. And they get to live there for up to a year with them and their child. And it's just one, one unit for family. And so she really gets that real taste of independence and, and is doing you know a lot of things on her own. But we're still there to help her out. And then our second um, program that we do not have open yet and do not have the property yet is our immediate rescue program, and that is sincerely needed in Iowa. And I could tell story after story, and I'm not paying attention to time when, so you're gonna have to. Okay. No, <laughs> okay. Um, we have so many young women. I got a phone call one day from a young woman that had just escaped her traffic, or she called me from the behind a dumpster in downtown Des Moines, literally. And she told me, she goes, do you have a bed? Well, we were even open at the time, and I was gonna help her find a place, and then, she said, she just said, I got to go. And she shut the phone and it went off and I don't know whatever happened to her, but had we have had a place, um, we could have brought her in. Another young woman um, needed a place. She'd been at the shelter downtown, was being trafficked out of the shelter downtown. Um, and um, yeah, and I'll tell you, actually, a lot of that has come up to the Indian reservations from the shelter downtown. Um, but anyway, she uh, she wanted out, so my friend called me. Uh, we were looking for a place, again, this is early on. Uh, we're looking for a place for her, and by the time we found a place, which was, and she made contact with us again, it was almost a week later. And then she told my friend that she didn't need help. Her new boyfriend was going to let her out. They were going to move into the basement of his grandfather's house. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of know probably what happened with that. So having an immediate rescue home where that phone call can happen, somebody can pick her up and have her in the pathway house immediately is so needed in our whole state. And our goal for that is truly just to get her off the street and to safety. And then after she's there, and this won't be a long term, but after she's there, we'll figure out what she needs. We'll give her different options. We'll work with our local communities and you know giving her those options and just let her know what's available and then help her get there. So. 
So how is a restoration program meeting our current needs? Uh, the National Practices Survey Report in 2017 asked participating agencies to indicate conditions in which they would most likely decline a referral. The number one condition was a woman having children in her custody. So just confirmed that we were walking down the right path and helping these young moms. So this means that women with children in their care accounted for 61.7% of participating agency declines, mm -hmm. not allowing her to come. So women who have been trafficked should never have to choose between her freedom and her children. Yet so many are forced to choose because of the limited number of programs, both for mothers and for children. For many survivors of sexual exploitation, finding adequate and affordable housing and long-term employment can be very difficult for various reasons. Past criminal history, a lack of standard working history. Um, many of them come with us with absolutely no identification. And so we have to have that to work anywhere. Uh, physical and mental health limitations and concerns. And her time in Garden Gate Ranch Restorative Program helps her overcome all of these obstacles. And that's why we were so excited when we opened the cottages so we could have that program. We provide strength-based trauma-informed care, counseling, therapies such as EMDR, equine therapy, dance, art, and that's just to mention a few, like we're always doing something, uh, life coaching, spiritual guidance, uh, parenting classes, financial planning, and uh, we help them get the right legal services if they need that, and we help them get their GEDs, or some of them have already had their actual diploma, and so then they help, we help them get to VMAC and start working on their education, and then also job training. Our ranch is full of opportunity for each young woman to have the space that she needs to discover, refresh, and renew her body, soul, and spirit. So I'd like to leave you with a couple of quotes. As we gather, there's always something happening, right? So as we gather with our families for holiday dinners, football games, birthday celebrations, or going vacations, take a moment to consider that thousands of young women, young men, and children are being sold, rented out for sex in our communities right in plain sight. I, for one, won't turn my back on them and do nothing, and I pray that you won't either. Together, let's make a difference for the love of each one of them. I want to thank you um, for being part of helping and to save each one of these young women's future. And then a quote I love from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Our lives begin and end the day we become silent about things that matter. Let's not be silent because every life matters. I'd be happy to do any Q and A if you want me to do it now, or we can do it later. Go right ahead. We also have um, Detective Jana Tuttle okay. can also answer questions. All right. Any questions? And speak well. Yes. I heard of a I heard of a hand signal. If if the child is in trouble, a, a hand signal. Are, are there any signals like that that we could use? Could help determine. Um, I, that, I can't answer that question. And maybe you can. I don't know that I've specifically heard of a hand signal per se. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of signs that you can um, look for. All kinds of things that you know that are just not normal. You know, that, and we all know, like a child in distress, what that looks like. Sometimes it's not overly obvious. Sometimes it is. With children, I feel like it would probably be very difficult because they're children of like is that a two or a three you were holding up. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like difficult to say per se if that was what they were reaching for, what they weren't reaching for. Oh yeah, sure. I can just talk. I got a very loud voice also. <laughs> <laughs> I can definitely do that. Any other questions? Is there something that we can look for? I mean, and if we if we see something that we think is suspicious, we would call the dispatcher. Absolutely. I mean, we always say 
see something, say something, you know, you, if there's something that you see is weird, if you see, you know, a child that doesn't really feel like, or doesn't appear that they're overly comfortable with the adult that they're with, um, call, call 911, call the dispatch number, call the non-emergency number. Um, either way, if you call 911 or you call the non-emergency number, you're still going to get an officer. It's not that it's, you know, if two calls come in at one time, the 911 call, um, I don't even say answers quicker than the non-dispatch or the non-emergency number, I'm sorry. Um, either way, you're going to get an officer out there quickly, especially if you describe what you're seeing, you know, the, the feeling you get from it. We've all had those times where we just have that gut feeling, something's not right, you know, and so that's the time where you, you call and we get there as quickly as we can to investigate it or, you know, try to go from there with, with whatever is happening. So absolutely call. And I will just say, I have on the back table there um, indicators of human trafficking, and then I also have some little uh, cards that you can put in your wallet, it, it, same thing, indicators. Um, I also have um, the effects of human trafficking on a person, some common symptoms that they may be experiencing, and then also our brochure, if anybody wants to grab any of those, you're welcome. Yes? Yeah, one of the things, that, I know this about Mark's account, our police and department are trained. And if you call and it's not the issue, they are professional enough to be able to sort it out and walk away. So don't worry about calling. Yeah. Now there's some, I lived all over Iowa. Some counties are not safe to make that kind of a call. But it is here. And please call. They'll sort it out. It may be something you didn't see. And that's okay, because they'll walk out of it. And the other party will feel happy about it. If it's something they need to deal with, they'll deal with it. I mean, we got a lot of domestic violence. We do. Yeah. Well, and I will say, too, we've been told numerous times, call 911 first. That's fine calling the hotlines, that really you're going to get your fastest response by local law enforcement. You call the hotlines and they somebody there takes it, then they're calling leadership right in your department and then going from there and it could take two hours to get yeah, the okay. message out to the officers and you don't have to know really what's happening like she said if something looks odd if you see something say something you're not gonna have to more than likely go to court or anything it's okay. that it's up to them to investigate it but it just looks very odd make the phone <laughs> call let them know what you've seen and then they'll go from there yes ma'am how is Garden Gate funded? It's all private donations. We get no, we don't ask for any government money. Um, so we have an annual gala every year, which we have around anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people that attend. And um, then we, it's just all privately funded. Did you leave an address for us? Um, if you want to grab one of the brochures, okay. um, our address is on the yeah, back. Thank you. But yeah. Thank you for asking. How are you acting like? I mean, how do, how do the girls know this one? Yep. So we're part of a national alliance uh, for real referral system. So referrals go in there, then they send them out to all the homes. Uh, so we get them from there. We get them from Rescue America. We've gotten them from local law enforcement. I've gotten phone calls from Broadlands Hospital. Um, the FBI has called us. So, and then other homes know, like if somebody's calling, a home in Nebraska and they don't take women with children, well, they know that we do, so then we get phone calls from them. So it really is all over. We're on the internet. You can Google the Garden Gate Ranch and or you know trafficking restorative homes and find us that way. So and then even some of the young women are calling directly. So yes. What is the result next not legal, but the legislative connections you guys have on trying to get the laws changed? To protect these young women on their say victims. I prefer the word survivor. That's my, my preference. What is the connection you have there? Um, actually, I'm just really good friends with Governor Reynolds. <laughs> um, and I became friends with her during this process of learning and just being involved. Um, so we aren't really um our our goal and our the job we do is in-house with our residents. Right. And I'm not out doing any kind of legislation or anything like that, but I am very supportive of all of, you know, the ones that are doing that. 
but as far as us doing it, we aren't. Governor Reynolds did come out and sign the last bill at Garden Gate Ranch. Um, and had, you know, the attorney general and about 30 people came out with her and did a tour. I think that's one of that question though. I guess what I'm wondering too is is there is there some legislation that should be that should be looked at that would help? I mean, I, 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 are there many people prosecuting for that? I mean, you know, and they always it, that's been our frustration. Honestly, it's all of our frustrations. I think even yours, right? Um, it it takes so many man hours to investigate these cases and to bring them to court, and then even at that point young women or men have to be able to testify and many of them just want to go on with their lives and won't do it. Um, so it's easier, the system, it's easier to get them on a, on a different charge, whether it's drugs or anything else, um, to put them away versus all of that. And I know you can speak way into that than I can. Um, and that's frustrating. I would love to see a law passed all over the United States that the buyers, or who's going to prison. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Period. Yeah. <laughs> if we never bought sweet corn, Iowa would never grow sweet corn, right? Right. <laughs> so if we had no buyers buying these young women and these children, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be a problem. So I think programming is there for a minute for the young for the young guys. Because most of the time I hear programming for the yeah. young ones. Yeah. Are there programs for you know I think now um, I think there's five, only five homes and they're like farms or ranches that, um, help young men, but you're right. Most like five in the United States. Yeah. Five, five in the United States, not my life. <laughs> we don't have, as far as I know, we don't have any. I'm not aware. I'm not aware. Yeah. yeah. And I will also say, um, young men have a harder time coming forward with that kind of information, more so than women have. We've been, you know, I think, taught more of being able to speak up and, you know, whole me to thing. <laughs> a lot, I think. I think, like she said, one of the biggest problems that we have uh, yeah. sorry, from, from the law enforcement aspect, one of the large problems that we have are having cooperative victims you know we we encounter the victims we we remove them from the situation we get them to a safe place where they can you know get the help that they need but then asking the victim to stand in front of a courtroom full of people that they don't know and walk all of these strangers through everything that they experience day in and day out and also the probability of standing five feet away from their abuser or from the person that was, you know, supplying them with their drugs, supplying them with this, you know, it, it's a very unfortunate lifestyle, but it is a lifestyle that they are forced into. So having, having that, I guess, face them is a big reason why victims don't follow through with prosecution of their abusers or, you know, of the people that are, are buying them, that are buying their services. Um, it's, it's just a very difficult thing for them to be able to do. Um, you know, I can't say that I could imagine standing in front of 30 people telling them what happened to me for the last 30 years of my life, if that was the lifestyle that I was forced into. Um, I do want to add to the, you know, from my, my perspective, something that I see a lot um, is, social media. Um, I, I had a very, uh, firsthand, <laughs> I had a, I had a very firsthand experience seeing a, an abuser in the process of grooming a victim. Um, I read all of the text messages. I read all of the interactions. I read all of it. Um, it started on a website, um, I can't remember the name of it now. It's escaping me. Um, it's a website that that gamers go to. Mm -hmm. So if you're a big video game fan, um, it was uh, they Discord? got in, huh? Was it Discord? Discord, yes. Um, they got in contact with the victim on Discord, 
Um, the victim had a very low self-esteem, um, did not have a whole lot of friends, did not have a whole lot of social interaction outside of going to school every day where the victim did not fit in well with people. Um, the victim was like, I, I can say it because I am like a, like a, a nerd, you know, like they, they play games a lot. I do too. Um, they, their solace was finding, um, happiness in their, in books and, you know, things like that, which I'm a big person of that too. So I feel like I can say that. Um, however, the victim is asked to do simple things such as chores around the house. This was how it started. The victim was upset because they got their gaming system taken away. They couldn't get on their gaming system and play because they didn't clean like their parents told them to clean. So the victim was upset. Victim got on Discord, talked to somebody that they had been speaking to that they thought was their friend. Um, it was actually you know, somebody that was looking to, to groom them. And it was, your parents are awful. I can't believe that they make you do things around the house. They treat you the, the most... I guess upsetting thing to me that I read in this entire exchange was they treat you like a slave. Do you want to be a whipping dog for the rest of your life? Mm. The victim was asked to clean their room. The victim was asked to, I think, vacuum and do the dishes. Clean their room, vacuum, and do the dishes. Think of all of the different times that we have been asked to do the same thing by our parents. You know, when I grew up, I cleaned the house. I did the dishes. My mom didn't do any of that because my mom worked full time. You know, my mom did all of that. So I did what I could around the house. That's all the victim was asked to do. That was it. And that was all it took for that predator to get in with that victim. Thankfully, it was stopped. It was recognized right away once the messages were found um, and nothing happened with the victim, you know, it was, we shut it down right away. So there was never um, the possibility for the victim to be trafficked, but it was very obvious that that's what was happening was in the process. Was that by surveillance or how did you, how did you find out about the texting? Or... I'm not going to give you any details on that. <laughs> it, it was, um, <clears throat> I can just, say that it was not by um, surveillance. It was by just observation of a parent. Mm -hmm. um, something that, you know, like mm -hmm. if if you're going to allow your, your children to have social media, if you're going to allow them, there better be very, very, very strict guidelines on what they are allowed to have, what they are not allowed to have. Um, I have two kids. At any moment, I will walk up to my child and I will say, give me your phone. And I will take it and I will look through absolutely every single thing. And, you know, something that you can look for on, on phones with uh, kids, especially teenagers, are their double apps. So like you have your calculator app, right? Everyone, probably everyone has a smartphone. Um, you open your calculator app and you can press a certain sequence and it takes you to a completely separate app that is connected to that. Yeah, all kinds of things that just blow your mind that you don't you don't even have any idea that these things exist. My teenager told me about that. I had no clue. My teenager was like, oh, is that a ghost app? And I was like, what's a ghost app? <laughs> and so, you know, there's all these different things that they can do that they can um, access in order to get a hold of victims. And it's just, you break a victim down and then you take advantage of that. So, things to look for. Any other questions I can answer from the law enforcement side? Yeah. Was the person that was trying to groom this child, was he ever penalized, brought into justice, or anything happened with him? That I don't know. I, I don't believe so. I believe the parents just, just shut it down and then worked with the child to, okay, clearly we're you know, having an issue here, what steps can be taken in order to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again? And a lot of it was just getting that child to see their self-worth and getting their child to have more confidence in themselves and understand really what was right from wrong. You know, the child didn't feel like they fit in anywhere. So they were just trying to fit in with somebody. They were just, oh, this person accepts me and this person is, you know, willing to be on my side. 
And so it was just working. They worked more with the child than they did. I will say a lot of a lot of situations come from um, involving drugs. You know, you'll have people that are addicted to drugs, and this is how they get their fix. And until they are ready to stop, they're not going to stop. So, um, but like I said before, if you if you see something, say something, whether it's a child or an adult. You know, absolutely, if it's an adult too that you see something you know, weird at a gas station, absolutely call, you know, if, if somebody looks like they're in distress, call, if they look like they're just extremely uncomfortable, call, like we as the law enforcement are always, always available, we might be busy at the moment, but you know, we will go, we will go, we will try to do everything that we can to get them into the hands of people that can help them, you know, get out of that lifestyle. Yeah. The number of victims in Washington County that contact with in the last year. I don't have any numbers. <laughs> no, I, I'm sure that I can get them, um, but I just didn't have them today. I I know that we have been in contact with victims. Um, I've been on the force for three years, and I think personally it would be less than a handful of people that we have, you know, dealt with it. And and maybe they're just saying, I need out of this situation. And we can help do that as an immediate fix for them. 